So hello, everybody, and welcome to this special episode um, where we're going to be talking about vestigial traits in animals and humans. So if you don't know what vestigial traits are, um, they're basically like what you could think of as evolution's leftovers. So as animals um, or plants change throughout time, sometimes they've developed a, a structure or an organ that they don't need anymore. Um, after they've, you know, after like that species or what have you has changed. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But with me here to help with that is my friend Ian McLaughlin, Dr. Ian McLaughlin, who is a um, neuroscientist. And so he's going to help me with some of the human examples. Hey, everybody. Hey, Ian, yeah, welcome. me and McLaughlin. No, thank you. Um, hey, Scott, thanks for hopping in, man. Uh, yeah, so I have a PhD in neuroscience and I uh, my research focus on, focused on basically a, a really evolutionarily ancient part of the brain um, that's like right in the middle, right? Like in the core of the brain that regulates basically the relationship between your emotion and your outward behavior. Um, it's called the medial lobenula interbronchial nucleus. And it's one of those brain regions that's been on Earth in an animal of some sort for at least 350 million years. And it's very not vestigial. <laughs> but um, but I, you know, the uh, vestigial traits have always been this this kind of concept in, in biology that's been kind of interesting to me because it is one of the most sort of like clear demonstrations of evolution. Um, and so, yeah, looking forward to getting getting into it. Yeah, and so my research focuses on bats. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm working on my PhD at University of Michigan. So I would be totally remiss if I didn't start this episode with a bat example. Um, so to get us to get us really started though here, um, for those of you who don't know, like our the structure that makes up the human hand in other animals has developed into all sorts of other different structures. So our hand is um, evolutionary has evolution from an evolutionary sense has like a common um, root with like the paw of a cat or also the fin of a whale or even the wing of a bat. So the bones that make up our fingers, for example, in a bat's wing have extended and now form the support structure for their wing. Um, so if we think about like the ancestor of a bat was this little animal, marsupial-like thing, that pre-marsupial even like thing, that crawled around eating insects. This picture is a little bit weird because it looks like the insect is just gonna like crawl into its mouth of its own volition. Um, but this is like the pre-flying ancestor of the bat. Oh, thank you so much, Christian and uh, David Howden for the awards. Um, so, but after we get past that stage, we, the idea is that, okay, the ancestor of bats was this little thing crawling around. Then later, it was this animal that glided. It didn't have powered flight. It didn't have wings, but it had skin stretched out between its feet so that it could glide. In fact, I think my sweater, I can even like do this kind of with my sweater. It's like this, like it just has like extra skin. But eventually we uh, get a little bit more refined in our evolutionary design and we have a bat which has powered flight and it has this very thin wing membrane still supported by its long finger bones but it can flap and power its flight. Um, and so bats now, they have, um, let's look at this, let me pull up this other picture where I've sort of highlighted the different digits of the bat. So if you look at those, oops, if you look at those circles in the front of its wing on this picture, you can see, sorry, this picture, you can see that um, the, like with the circles in front, those are where the bat's thumbs are because its wings are like this and its thumbs still have claws on them. But all of its other fingers, which are sort of hanging out in the back part of the wing, there's no more claws that are left there. But what's interesting is if we look at a fossil, an ancient fossil of a bat, we can see that um, bats used to have a lot more claws. So this is a fossil called, um, the species is called uh, Onychonycterus finii. And this is a bat that no longer exists, but we have this beautiful fossil 
where we can actually see claws at the tips of all of its um, appendages. So in this picture, all of those little circles are the ends of bat fingers that still have claws attached, which is pretty cool. Um, so none of our modern bats have claws anymore, but this ancient, this ancient bat did. And we can see it a little bit better in this artistic rendering uh, where we have a bat flying that has claws on its thumbs, on the front of its wings, but also on all of its other fingers. And so basically that happened because the evolution, the evolutionary ancestor, that little animal that was crawling around on all fours eating insects, it had claws at the bottom of all of its fingers. And those claws were useful because they helped it to grab onto things. And as uh, it developed into this animal that had powered flight, it kind of had this evolutionary leftover thing where it still had the claws um, for all of its fingers, even though it didn't need them anymore. Um, so yeah, it's pretty cool because we can see how like vestigial traits work over time. We see that the, there's this trait that hung out and was still around and then it wasn't needed anymore. And so eventually it disappeared, but bats kept their thumb claws because their thumb claws are actually still useful to them. So if we look at like another picture of a modern bat here, we can see that it's using um, it's using one that one little claw on its thumb in the top left of the picture. It's using the one claw on its thumb to like hold on to this piece of rock as it's climbing around in the cave. So like basically the takeaway from this uh, for the audience members here is that you know vestigial traits might disappear with time, but because evolution is so slow, it takes a long time for the species to kind of become optimized to its new environment and surroundings. And so we see these in between phases where um, we might have, for example, a bat with lots of claws. But Ian knows about a lot of these examples in people. So Ian, I'm curious, um, what what are there what are some instances of this happening with people that you can share with us? Yeah, so so there are a bunch of um, of examples of vestigial traits in humans, um, and I have a, I have a couple examples, but um, I'm thinking maybe we'll we'll sort of explore one of them um, in greater depth because it sort of bridges the gap between, uh, or it sort of demonstrates the relationship that we have with other animals. Um, both whom we share a last common ancestor. But so, so one of them is called the vomeronasal organ. Okay, it's also sometimes called Jacobson's organ, particularly when talking about snakes. But it is an organ uh, that, that basically any animal you can think of has. And it, it's basically part of our olfactory system, you know, our sense of smell. And so, so just as, as an example, um, if you have a cat, uh, you could right now see its vomeronasal organ. Sorry, I'm trying to find my picture of it so you can see it. And it is right here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. We have a lot of pictures. So we're, uh, yeah. there we go. All right. So maybe we can do that. Um, yeah, whatever. Okay. Um, so, so you can see, uh, you know, I put that little yellow arrow there pointing to a, it, it. I know it's probably a little bit small, but there's this like little sort of nubbin. Um, at the roof of the cat's mouth, right? It's like a knobby thing. And like that that's ridge. where the- It's just like yeah, in the center exactly, yeah. behind the teeth, okay. Right, it, it's like a little knob sort of at the end of that ridge, right? Um, and so, so yeah, so that that's um, where its von um, um organ is. And, you know, as a part of the olfactory system, it, it basically responds to specific molecules that are just floating through the air. And those molecules can change these animals' uh, behavior or, you know, um, inner states. And so, um, you know, the, the description I, I, I gave is basically identical to how the broader olfactory system works, like the one that we have. We have receptors in our olfactory system that end up binding specific molecules that are floating around in the air. And depending upon which of those receptors are bound at any one time, we can experience the smell of roses or a citrusy smell of an orange, or importantly, you know, the smell of something that might be decomposing or rotting. Right? Right, that, that's vile to us. It's, it's disgusting, and so um, you know that's that's one of the fundamental roles of our olfactory system, which is a very unique sensory system, by the way. When it comes to like 
our sensory systems like vision and, and our auditory system, our ability to hear things, distinguishing between foods that are safe or nutritious or you know good for us and foods that are dangerous because of stuff like bacteria are growing on it. That's a really important role that pretty much only our olfactory system can really uh, do for us. But so, so, you know, that's the sort of basic fundamental function of our olfactory system. You know, there's obviously quite a bit more to our sense of smell than just, you know, is this thing going to be yummy or is it going to kill me? <laughs> right. You know, we appreciate we associate things like um, what our home smells like. Right. Or, or what our favorite restaurant might smell like or, you know, what our significant other might smell like, you know, or as the dad of a tiny little human. Let me tell you that smelling the baby's head is a thing I do completely reflexively. And she smells awesome. And I'm sure she only really smells awesome to me and, you know, her other and her mother. <laughs> but all of that complexity is conveyed through our sense of smell, right? It's not purely identifying certain molecules or categorizing molecules. It has a more substantial effect on our consciousness, right? And so, um, you know, while, while we are genetically very similar to other primates like chimpanzees um, um, and bonobos, their olfactory system is even more influential for them right, in terms of like their inner states, their consciousness than ours is to us. And so, you know, while we have, we do technically have a vomeronasal organ, you know, just like your pet cat does, theirs is far more functionally relevant than ours. Theirs has receptors that bind, you know, specific molecules again, right, just like our the broader olfactory system, but the specific receptors associated with the vomeronasal organ bind a certain category of molecules that convey different characteristics about particularly the other animals around them and particularly other animals of their own species. And so, you know, you might have all heard of pheromones, right? Which are, you know, molecules that all, essentially all animals secrete that are sort of like indicators of their and our uh, uh, inner biological states, right? And other animals are definitely more potently influenced by, by pheromones, uh, particularly when it comes to reproductive behavior. But um, it can also convey an animal's emotional state. Right, like fear, for example, there are certain molecules that animals will secrete when they're um, feeling fear. And this is like even fish do this. Um, and so the vomeronasal organ is the sort of ground zero for when it comes to processing all of those chemical cues, right? It's sort of like a nonverbal language. Um, and, you know, so, some animals even have like a specific maneuver that they do more effectively to get those molecules to their vomeronasal organ. Sort of like how they how they might move their ears to hear specific things. More on that later, by the way. That's another vestigial trait that we have. But uh, but anyways, yeah. The bomb is is that like when cats make that weird face, like when they're trying to smell? Mm -hmm. Does that have to do with getting? Uh... That's exactly the maneuver. Yeah, yeah. It's like sort okay. of like a they sort of wrinkle up a little bit. That's like I don't I don't know if there's like a name for that move. Um, but, there uh, there is. I can't remember it now. I want to look it up. I know that like. The picture that they often use of lions looking really angry, for example, like it looks like the yeah. lion is roaring or something and they're like, ah. it's really them like trying to get air into their nose, to, I guess, to their femoral nasal organ to smell better mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Right. Um, and so, you know, when it comes to the vomeronasal nasal organ in humans, it's definitely a controversial topic. Um, you know, we know that the same types of cells that ultimately generate the organ in other animals also arise during human embryonic development. So they're, you know, the, the basis is there. And that's not surprising. We are, after all, pretty genetically related to those other animals, particularly chimpanzees, right? Um, but the most common argument that I've heard is that when it comes to the human biology, right, human vomeronasal organ, it's we sort of have it. But it's like a shriveled, barely functional version of an organ that's significantly more active in other animals. And, you know, sort of like sort of like, you know, our pinky toe compared to the pinky toe of a chimpanzee. Right. And in case you've never seen the foot of a chimpanzee, it is bananas. Ha! Huh. It is wild. <laughs> um, here. Check. So, so that's the foot of a chimp. I mean, look at their pinky. It's like it looks like a finger. It looks like my actual pinky. Right. And then compare that to, you know, our pinky toes that are just sort of like you know, shriveled, pointless little stubs, right? Um, and so, uh, so, so that's sort of like, you know, the equivalent of our vomer and nasal organ. It's there technically, but you wouldn't miss it if it wasn't, right? Um, and so, and then also another line of evidence to suggest that it is essentially vestigial um, is when scientists have explored the genes that are active in, you know, the human equivalent of the vomer and nasal organ, most of those genes are what we call pseudogenes. Right. So versions of genes that over evolutionary time underwent changes that basically made them non-functional. Right. Um, 
now, all that said, it is definitely controversial. There are some studies that's, that suggest that humans do respond to pheromone-like molecules. And I'll, I'll end on this example because it's just a classic example that I think is really fun. Um, so th there was a famous study or series of studies conducted by a scientist named Klaus Wedekind, right, using T-shirts that guys wore to go to sleep overnight for two days. So his results suggested that heterosexual women tended to prefer the odors um, on T-shirts of males who had basically the equivalent of immune systems that are that were rather different from their own, right? So they would, you know, you could predict which shirt a heterosexual woman would prefer by knowing the genetics of a dude's immune system, right? And so there's an interesting whole sort of possible explanation, interpretation for why that might be the case in humans. Um, and the argument was, okay, there's some evidence for, if not pheromone specifically, you know, the type of, you know, vomeronasal reactions that other animals have where they'll prefer certain other members of their species, they can detect fear, they can detect aggression. Um, and so, but I, I think it's safe to say that the consensus in neuroscience is that, you know, while we may have something like a vomeronasal organ, you know, the equivalent of like the pinky of a vomeronasal organ, you know, it is like the pinky toe version and it's largely inconsequential. So vestigial. All right. That's my first example. I'll, uh, yeah, no, I'll that's, that's a great example. Can I ask um, you might have said it and then I might have missed it, but like why, what's the reasoning for like why humans would not be, not need that ability as much? So, I mean, you know, it's, it's, and I, I know that you're very familiar with these examples, particularly since you were more in evolution than I did. Um, but there is no really great exam, great explanation. I mean, you know, I say it's controversial. Like there are definitely neuroscientists, respected neuroscientists who are, are far more uh, bullish on uh, humans being driven more by olfaction than the sort of accepted wisdom would suggest. Um, and so, you know, they would suggest it, it's not shriveled. Like, it, you know, it, it is functioning the way it evolved. You know, it, it didn't shrivel. It's just, uh, you know, that's how it's always been in our branch, you know, when we branched off from Pan, right, from uh, chimps and bonobos and stuff. Um, but, you know, the other argument would be we have, you know, better, more effective sensory systems that will, you know, signal the types of things that the vomeronasal organ would handle in more primitive organisms, right? That don't have really excellent vision, that, you know, don't have higher cognitive function that can, you know, I can see that certain features of this other, you know, group of the tribe and, you know, whatever. And let's just take American society, like, you know, long hair, or, you know, whatever, certain like secondary sexual characteristics. And so we don't really need to like smell you know, <laughs> to, to yeah. have a sense of whether or not you find this person attractive, right? That That's what I would imagine would be the kind of standard. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing, I'm seeing like a few different examples. And I mean, this gets at the idea of why vestigial organs are expected to disappear eventually, because there's a cost to having them, right? It takes mm -hmm. some energy to produce them, like developmentally when you're forming in the womb or whatever, and to maintain them potentially. Um, so if humans have other ways of getting this information, like talking to somebody um, that work better, then like you would expect that that thing would just kind of like eventually disappear. It will take longer to disappear than something that's evolutionary disadvantageous, that's like actively like individuals with that characteristic are like actively getting killed or something like that. It's like, or, oh, or they can't trait, reproduce as much. Yeah, that trait is, yeah, that trait is going to disappear quickly. But with vestigial organs, it seems like they often hang out for a while because it's not necessarily bad to have them. Um, they're relatively or it's not neutral. it's not bad enough to prevent them from reproducing, right? right. So yeah. you know, it's not super expensive. It doesn't really interfere with their ability to reproduce. It's not like it's sexually gross to whomever they want to reproduce with. But yeah, so so um, so James brings up the appendix. That is a great example where we can explore that debate because. The appendix can be a, a pretty problematic part of the body, and it potentially can be a valuable part of the body. Um, more recent evidence suggests, but uh, we'll we'll talk about the appendix uh, later. Yeah, and I mean it's super exciting. Like the thing is, because vestigial organs have hung on for so long, it's actually like you know humans have an appendix, but also like rabbits have one. Like a lot of different mammals have an appendix of varying degrees and sizes and so you can sometimes look like across the evolutionary tree of life and see like oh humans maybe don't use theirs very much rabbits have something like it that's very important 
Um, and so you can you can see it because like it takes so long to dis disappear like sisters or sister species and like all these related groups of species will still have something that's useful or not useful to varying degrees and that can help us get at the different questions about like why is this thing still here or what did it used to do yeah well I um, mean I so I do have another example um, yeah. if if you're, if you're game. Yeah, I was okay. just gonna, I was just gonna get it another. I was gonna say like, yeah, you have, what other examples do you have for us, Ian? I have a bunch. So, so you're gonna have to stop me at a certain point, but okay. one of my favorite um, examples of, of human vestigial trait are goosebumps. And so um, this is like an example of our, or goose pimples, I think some folks call them particularly in the UK or, or goose skin. It, it's, it's, it's another example of like the footprint of our evolutionary ancestors in, in our biology, right? And so, um, you know, here, I'll give you, it's actually a really interesting mechanism uh, that that enables it to happen. Okay, so, but it's sort of ridiculous, right? It's kind of ridiculous, you know, we, what, that we'd have all these tiny little muscles. So that's what you're seeing on the top there. See that little red thing that's sort of like oscillating? That's a muscle that's adjacent to each hair follicle. And that's its entire purpose is to do exactly what you're seeing, right? That we, you know, and, and it's just ridiculous that we'd have all these, think about how many muscles that, that equates to itsy bitsy little hairs along our body, hairs that you can barely even see to begin with, right? And the entire function of them is just to make those little hairs stand up. It's kind of ridiculous. And so I haven't seen a particularly convincing explanation for um, some like actual useful function of, of goosebumps in, in humans. Um, I think if we were really stretching our imaginations, you know, I, I could imagine that there could theoretically be a social function, like where if I see someone experiencing goosebumps, I sort of have an inside look into the nature of their inner emotional sensory experience in a way that they can't control, right? So it's sort of like another mechanism by which humans can communicate with one another. I don't really buy that, to be honest. Uh, I, I, I like it's, this it's idea where like you have, you're like, there's danger and then you have goosebumps and then the, the hair standing on end like allows you to feel like the air movements of someone coming up behind you and you're like, mm. ah, I gotcha. That's interesting. That that's an interesting one. Uh, I'm a little bit more convinced by, by that. Um, but then, so so you know, if you think about um, our our you know primate ancestors, right? Our much hairier ancestors, right? Um, it, it's a holdover from them. And so you know, we basically get goosebumps under pretty much two situations, right? Um, so you know, the first is when we're chilly, and the second is if we're starting to experience a fight or flight reaction, right? A fearful reaction, like Georgia was bringing up. And so, they're frankly pretty useless in both of those situations for us, right? Except for maybe, you know, being sort of conversation between your autonomic and your somatic nervous systems, right? Your conscious and unconscious nervous systems, you know, where your conscious nervous system is like, oh, I'm having goosebumps. That's because I'm, I'm afraid, you know, like that, yeah. that's not really a great uh, explanation, but um, pretty useless, right? But, you know, if we were still covered in from head to toe with fur, all those tiny little muscles, you know, um, uh, standing up all those those hairs, all that fur hair upward, right? Um, it would start to have a pretty meaningful effect on a couple of things. First, on what we look like, right? Um, as well as how much heat is trapped by that air. And so the concept is that, you know, the reason we get goosebumps when we're either cold or we're in a fight or flight situation, survival situation, is um, because they happen to trap heat you know, more effectively, sort of like a like a winter coat, right? Um, but then also uh, would have made, you know, our hairier ancestors ever so slightly bigger, right? Because we just, you know, we, but we appear to take up more space. Uh, tons of animals do that kind of thing, particularly like certain fish will just like have these really elaborate, like lionfish or I think, right? They'll have these elaborate spines that come out and there's sort of like this threatening display. A lot of animals just try to make themselves bigger. Um, and so that, that's one of the, the examples or, or the explanations for the role that it played when we were hairier, that it's now just sort of like, it just happens. We can't really stop it. And it's, again, it's not super expensive, right? And it's not like, you know, anybody's going to be like, oh, this person's gross. They have goosebumps seldomly, you know, <laughs> um, but, you know, but it, but it did have a functional role, you know, or, or you know, a, an evolution, an adaptive role um, in our evolutionary um, past. So that, that, that's one of the, the sort of fun examples. And I know watching videos of goosebumps can sometimes give people goosebumps. So I'll take those off. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, David Howden, I believe, yeah, brought up another example that I think you were alluding to when we were talking before the show happened. But he brought up, um, am I right that the twin tendons down the wrist are vestigial claw retractors? 
that's an awesome topic. I mean, we, yeah. Okay. Why don't we get into that? So, um, so you are correct that in other animals that, that, that muscle is called the palmaris longus. Um, and so, so yeah, let's just get into it. So this is, a, this is an example of a vestigial structure in humans that, that sort of made the internet rounds a, a couple of years ago, I think. And it is also something that not every human has. And so we can all test ourselves. It, it's an easy test to do right here. Oh, let me, um, do this so you can actually see what it looks like. Um, ba, ba, ba. There we go. And while it's right. point, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, so it, what this the palmaris uh, longus is is it's, it's like really narrow, long muscle that pretty much runs along the bottom of the arm, right? Most people have it. Like by by far, most people have it. Some people only have it in one arm. It's kind of interesting. And some people, like me, don't have it at all. And so the way you can test, you can sort of see what this person is doing here is you sort of, you turn your palm to face, you obviously see it and you sort of, you, you know, tightly pinch your fingers together, sort of like the, you know, the, I, I work in New Jersey and that is like sort of the state gesture is this, <laughs> but um, you sort of pinch your fingers together kind of tightly and um, see if that little thingy bob stands out, right? Is it this? Yeah, it doesn't look. Wait, hang on. Do I, I have to have it, it facing it? towards me? No, well, uh. No, I don't think so. Oh I, I just only ever done it. I don't have it either. No, I don't have it. Um, isn't that wild? But yeah, so and wild. My wife actually does have it. Um, and so, you know, uh, your wife on so here. pretty much They're every primate that us. you can name. <laughs> <laughs> She's a little camera. I can't camera tell shot. if I have it or not. Um, I think maybe I do. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of tough to see. Yeah, maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. Yeah, it's sort of like off to the side. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. kind of tough to do it with your arm up like that. So We're okay, does it have yeah. it down? Oh, yeah. yeah, it's way more prevalent if I put my arm down. I wish there's, I think, but it's also kind of thicker than I thought. This is like very. It's pretty thick. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's um, like, whoop. it's like this whole thing here pops up. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, so you know, pretty much every primate has that, has that thing, um, who at least who's genetically sort of similar-ish to us. Think, you know, chimpanzees and orangutans and so on. But only some of them actually actively use it. Um, you know, cats have a, a palmaris longus, um, as I believe that was David that brought it up, um, for example, for claw retraction. If you've had a baby, you might have heard of the palmer reflex. Um, and so this is this adorable thing that babies do. It, it, it's this sort of like simple kind of test that can be done with a newborn um, where they'll pretty much grab onto anything you put in their hand. And it's pretty amusing and kind of adorable. Um, and, and other infant primates do this too. And it sort of makes sense that they do it because most of them rely on, you know, the, the, the other primates rely on the babies literally grasping onto their mother to be carried around and stuff. So the mother's hands are free. And I'm like 100% certain that my daughter wishes she could constantly grasp onto my wife and be adhered to her at all times. But, you know, once Homo sapien ancestors started branching off in our own direction, we no longer really relied on that so much. Um, but the muscle still develops and most of us still have it. Um, I think it's something like 14% of the population. And these numbers vary a bit uh, depending upon, you know, which communities you're, you're talking about. But about 14% of the population doesn't have it at all. Um, and it's a, a larger number has just one of them. And then, yeah, something, you know, approaching 80% of people have it. So yeah, it's a vestigial, uh, muscle. Kind of cool. That's cool. Um, Wait, is this, um, have you heard of Blaschko's lines? Someone mentions it in, in the comments. Um, I might see. just be butchering the name. I don't know if this Blaschko's is considered. Lines vestigial but i recently learned about blashko's lines hmm. uh we don't know about that frank tell us more we are excited yeah. to hear and a lot of people in the comments have super interesting ideas and thoughts um it was mentioned that birds also use like movements of their photo or of their feathers to communicate and stuff like that like just like the mammal hair raising on end can be useful um yeah, so lots of reasons to puff yourself up or what have you. Oh, oh wisdom. I, I just realized. Yeah, go ahead. I, I failed to actually, like, in case anybody's interested of where the vomeronasal organ is, um, that was the first thing we talked about. It, it's sort of like, 
it, it's basically right yeah. where that cat version is. Um, you know, it's sort of like sort of above the roof of our mouth, behind our nose kind of situation. Um, yeah. Anyways, I forgot to share that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's weird to me. Like we can't feel ours at all, like in our mouth, because the cat has like the bump. We don't have the bump, mm -hmm. but it's still like in there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly right. Is it like much bigger proportionally in the cats and that's why it's bumped yes. out or just like the positioning gets different? Okay. Definitely bigger. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I'm not familiar with Blaschko's lines. Just, just looking it up. Um, yeah. Like <laughs> I, I'm aware of, um, yeah. th there's like an example of certain um, women have a sort of interesting distribution of sweat glands, but um, I, yeah, I'm unfamiliar with this. Thank you for bringing it up. Yeah. We'll have to look into it. Uh, yeah. Scott has an update. Neither of his cats will let him find that organ. <laughs> which yeah. I'm, you have to be pretty a, careful. As a fellow cat owner, I'm not surprised by that. Um, yeah, not psyched. Yeah. Well, maybe we can switch to um, another, an animal example real quick, another an animal example, because I know that um, we've kind of talked already a lot about how it's not necessarily clear where, whether something is truly vestigial or not. And maybe this will be a good segue actually for human appendix discussions. Um, but so let's talk about, let's talk about whales. So for a long time, whale pelvis bones were thought to be vestigial. And this is, you know, from like a textbook or something like whales, um, clearly don't need a pelvis you know the purpose of our pelvis is like our legs attached to it and it has muscle connections and stuff that and structural support that lets our legs move around and allows us to walk but whales are actually um for those who don't know they evolved from something like this guy uh this pachycetus which is basically a mammal that used to be a terrestrial mammal a mammal that would walk around on the land but with time, um, the ancestors of the whales actually ended up going back to the water. So here's an artistic rendering based on some um, fossils that were found in Peru, I believe, of a more recent ancestor of the whale. And so this is after they started to transition like back to the water. So you have this animal that can walk on land. It also swims around in the water. It has webbed feet. Um, it's eating fish. And so this explains why whales have a pelvis in the first place, basically, right? Because they needed one at one point, their ancestors needed one so that they could like have four legs and walk around on land. Um, but as they went back into the water, so the story goes, the pelvis became less and less useful until eventually we get to this point where they basically have some like tiny leftover pelvis bones that aren't really doing anything, um, except for just like, you know, hanging out and continuing to exist. But um, yes, we've, Ian and I have been alluding to several times now, it's not always very clear whether something is truly vestigial or not. So what happens is, zooming out, evolutionary context, um, a trait has developed pelvis bones. It has a function, helping to walk around. And then as time goes on, this, the given species doesn't need that thing anymore. So three things can happen at this point. Either that trait can be repurposed. It can disappear with time um, or it can, um, or it can just like continue to exist and be there, but useless. So those are kind of the three options for vestigial traits. Um, in the case of the whale pelvis bone. So for a long time we thought, okay, it's still here, but it's not useful. But what they found is actually the pelvis bone is repurposed, no longer not useful. So these um, researchers, along with some other folks, oops, I got rid of the wrong image. Um, there was a study that came out recently where they found that this whale pelvis bone is actually useful. And what it's useful for is in mating, I guess muscles um, attach from the penis to the pelvis bone in whales and dolphins. And having a bigger, bigger pelvis bones actually allowed the animals to have uh, bigger penises, or I think specifically like bigger testes, which then that's that's good sometimes because it means that you can make more sperm and like outcompete the sperm of other males. 
Um, so basically these guys found that having a bigger pelvis actually was evolutionarily advantageous for whales and dolphins. Um, and this is, this is the paper here that came out just to give credit where credit is due. So these pelvic bones aren't vestigial. They're, they've actually been repurp repurposed and they're now getting acted on by, um, by sexual selection. So this is a cool example of how, you know, something that for a long time was the textbook example of something being vestigial is actually not vestigial. It's been repurposed, which is really cool because evolution works with what it has basically. And that sometimes means repurposing things in, in interesting ways. Um, so yeah, let's see, David Howden. Oh, we have a couple questions. Um, <laughs> Scott says, will ancestors were like, I've seen enough, I'm out of here, uh, possibly, yeah. Uh, David Howden says, in insects, some females are flightless with reduced or reduced or now wings, but males are wings. Would that count as vestigial? Ooh, so that is a really interesting question, David. Um, and I think it, it's interesting because it gets a lot at the scale of what we're talking about. So usually when we think of vestigial traits, we think of something that is no longer useful, like for the entire species. And we don't necessarily think of it being useful for like males versus females, um, because it's pretty hard to completely get rid of something for like just one sex of a species, because your, your genetics for that species are still like pretty similar. Um, I suppose like you could you you could say that it's vestigial like for the for the females but it kind of gets down to basically gets down to semantics um it's and becomes more of like a definitional question than like is this fundamentally like something that's um that's like hanging out in long evolutionary time because it's not useful anymore so i probably wouldn't say it's vestigial just because I think of vestigial as something that like evolution could have gotten rid of, but it hasn't. And because the males of the, the male insects are still using their wings, um, I would say that it's still useful like for the species. Yeah, but that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, sort of reminds me of the whole conversation about why uh, men have nipples, right? Oh, yeah, that's Where, true. You know, we, they are there and, uh, you know, with, with the right, exposure to molecules, you can get a male to, to lactate or somebody with a, with a Y chromosome to lactate, but they are essentially pointless in, in, you know, your standard, you know, X, Y carrying <laughs> human. Um, so, so Georgia, uh, when I was looking at that, that image, mm -hmm. uh, the cartoon of the, um, here, I'll just bring it up, <laughs> the whale pelt, this one. Oh, yeah. Um, so, so in their fins, I've always wondered this and like, I, I've never just taken the time, but are, are those those like finger like bones? Are they considered vestigial, the, like the bones themselves, or do they play like a, an important structural, mechanical role? Right. You know? So let me um, let me bring up the picture again of the of all the appendages lined up. So it's not an accident that I picked like this first uh -huh. picture. So if you look at um, the third from the left, that's like the zoomed in version of the whale fin. And so these are uh, like the, the front flippers of the whales, right? And you yeah. can see like on the bottom whale picture, like they don't have in their back, like they don't have any like important back um, flippers coming from their back pelvis that are useful. Um, but in the front, those fingers are still important for the structure of the fin, supposedly. Like, you know, it's helping um, their fins are like having pushing against like a lot of water and stuff. And so like those long finger mm. bones are like helping them push through the water still. Yeah. Not not so different from the wings of a bat, which are on the far right in that picture. Those fingers are providing like structural support. So, I mean, in a way, this is also an example of repurposing, though, right? Like humans, we mm -hmm. use our our fingers to help us like grasp, grasp things and hold on to them. Um, but in other animals, like this, this, these fingers have been like repurposed to do different things, to help push through water, to support your wing membrane as you're flying and pushing against the air, things like that. Right on. Yeah, it's cool to see uh, whale skeletons. <laughs> yeah, it, um, is, it is wild. So, so should we get into the appendix? Yeah, let's do the appendix. Okay, so this is probably the most well-known 
vestigial part of our body, the appendix, mm -hmm. right? Um, which basically seems to function as like a ticking time bomb that like may or may not very painfully explode randomly and require immediate surgery. But anyway, so, so I'm, I'm sure most people are like familiar with the appendix and where it is, but just in case you're not, here we are. So it's this silly little nubbit that sticks off, uh, you know, usually the lower right region of, of our intestines and it's pretty small. Um, interestingly, certain identical twins who are actually called mirror image identical twins, they can have their appendices on opposite sides of the body kind of cool, right? Mirror image twins are pretty neat. I think the, like Scott Kelly and Mark Kelly, the, the astronauts, I think that they are mirror image twins. Um, anyways, uh, so the, the notion that the appendix is vestigial goes back quite a long way. Uh, even, you know, good old daddy Darwin thought that it was useless. You know, he thought it was just a holdover from when the digestive system functioned differently in our ancestors. And that that is pretty much still kind of the accepted wisdom. But um, I went to grad school at a time when the microbiome, which um, the sum total of all of the various microbes that inhabit pretty much your entire body, different parts of your body will have different microbes. Um, you know, you have a microbiome of your eyes, right? You have a microbiome of your armpits, of your skin in general, of your hair and of your gut. And so I went to grad school when um, the microbiome was like the hottest topic in biomedical science. It still is sort of a, a pretty super hot topic. But um, anyways, uh, as a result, you know, that was when I first encountered the argument that it that the, the appendix is most definitely not useless. Uh, the argument um, from these uh, uh, microbiologists is that it functions as a kind of reservoir for the various m microbes that colonize our gut, right? Yeah, um, and, and so- Can I interject here real quick? Cause I just please. added this image. So like in, um, in other animals that have an appendix, it's actually called a cecum um, yeah. and so this picture of like a rabbit digestive tract, you can see on the sort of bottom right, there's like this big wormy sausage thing coming out. It's called the cecum. That's the rabbit's appendix, basically. And um, so it's the appendix is much bigger in some other animals. But in, in animals like rabbits, we certainly know that it functions exactly like Ian is saying. This is an important spot along the digestive tract. That's like it's almost like a little... Uh, like terrarium or vivarium or something where the rabbit kind of houses like all of these special microbes and the rabbit um, will divert like some of the food from its digestive tract into the cecum and it kind of those bacteria and microbes that are living there do like extra digestion stuff you know rabbits are eating a lot of grass and materials that are very difficult to break down from a digestive standpoint so some of that material gets shuttled off into the cecum and like extra digestion happens and then it gets pooped out. And what's interesting is like the poop from the cecum that the rabbit has um, is like a special poop. Like it looks different from their regular poop. It's like this like green, extra green poop. And the rabbits will actually eat that again because there's like stuff in there. They can get, if they send it back through their stomach, it can get like redigested and they can get more nutrients from it and stuff. Um, so they're like, oh, this has been broken down a bit more. And now if I like eat it again, I can get more nutrients from it. So in, in other mammals, in other animals that are related to humans, like rabbits, um, this is kind of what's happening with their appendix, with their cecum. And so then people, I think, started thinking, like Ian says, people are t paying attention more to microbes and able to understand and study them better. So then people started thinking, aha, like maybe the appendix is not so useless after all in humans. So yeah, Ian, sorry to interrupt, but tell us, yeah, tell us more about oh. that. Yeah, no, that that's excellent. Yeah, so so it can sort of function as a kind of hard drive, right? Or a hard drive backup of our whole, you know, um, of, of our microbiome, right? Um, and then they can recolonize the gut um, if we're exposed to a pathogen that causes, you know, diarrhea or, or, you know, in more modern times, if you're exposed to an antibiotic, because again, you're exposed to some kind of infection um, by a bacterium. Uh, but then, uh, so similar to that concept of the sort of like the hard drive backup of your uh, gut microbiome is that, um, you know, because we have all these little lovely microbes hanging out in that little nubbin, um, it, it's also a site where our immune system is sort of like constantly going to school, right? It's, it's constantly training B cells, T cells, special kinds that are specifically in our gut that are, you know, based, essentially constantly being trained in case we're exposed to some potential pathogen and it's game time for the immune system, right? All of a sudden they're, they're right there, they're ready to go, right? Um, and so, you know, 
That said, right, as important as we're, we're saying the appendix is in humans, people are completely fine without it. You know, so it's like it's like not super critical or anything like that. Um, but, you know, one of the more interesting explanations for um, how the appendix, the appendix came um, uh, came to take on its current role is that it may have had a completely different role in our ancestors. Right. Like not not even like what um, uh, Georgia was describing with uh, the cecum in, in some you mean other farther animals. back even. Farther, yes, right. Yeah. So more of like a traditional digestive role, right? And you know, like the rest of your gut, it, it also happened to be colonized by microbes, but that wasn't really its primary function. And so, you know, as our digestive systems evolved and our bodies evolved, it became sort of superfluous. Um, and but all of a sudden, that microbiome function became its primary function, right? Repurposing um, other, you know, structures in our body. And so, in other words, it's like a lot of parts of our bodies, right? It, it may be a part of the body that that had some role in the past, and then ultimately evolved to take on a new role over time. It evolved. Yeah, that's really cool. Are so you saying that it used to be used more for digestion in the sense of like, that food that like nutrients would actually be getting like extracted through there like they are in your intestines or something like that? Okay. Yeah, that, that it had like some sort of unique musculature that would interact with mm -hmm. whatever you've eaten in a unique way, right? Um, you know, just like we have a large intestine and a small intestine, they're very, very similar, but they do yeah. different things, right? Like the, the, um, the large intestine is much more devoted to extracting water from, uh, from, you know, our digesting food than the small intestine. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, there, then, then if you can have two different kinds of intest intestines, how about three, right? Um, yeah. and that, but then over time it just wasn't really useful. Right. And, and so you could just preserve resources by just not growing this giant hose. Right. Um, and, uh, and then bada bing, bada boom, you got a microbe reservoir in your gut. <laughs> cool. Um, so, That's I mean, I have awesome. other examples if, if you're, oh, okay. if you're interested, Okay. Yeah, so. I'm definitely interested. And I, one of the things that I think is so cool about going through these human examples is that, uh, relative to other animals, like humans are very well studied. Like we know more about humans than any other animal. And even in humans, it's not clear if these traits are actually vestigial or not oftentimes. And so I think that's so cool because it highlights like how much there is for us as biologists to still learn about, about the world and like how, how bodies work and, you know, like what's actually going on at, at this like functional level. Yeah. yeah. So what other examples uh, do you have for us, Ian? So I'm, I'm trying to see, I thought I had one more. Ah, here we go. Um, sweet. Oh, right. I have to, let's get rid of this puppy. Oh, I have to do that. Sorry, everybody. This is a little awkward. You're totally um, fine. I'm going to, I just real quick want to say um, thank you so much to David Dunn and David Howden and Christian Sase for the awards. Uh, we really appreciate it. It's really encouraging to get stuff like that. Um, and some of the comments here are pretty interesting. Well, Scott says to ask about or to talk about how appendicitis isn't a thing in underdeveloped countries. Is that true? Or do you know? Yeah, I've heard that. Um, you know, I, 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 I could get myself to believe that, but I, I also suspect that that's that there's not necessarily a huge difference. Um, Maybe it's like more a that difference in reporting or something like that. In reporting, but then also a difference in other biomedical conditions that, you know, that sort of dominate, that, that become a problem earlier on, in other words. Um, and so appendicitis doesn't really, you don't have enough time really to get to the point where you develop appendicitis. But I mean, you could be right. I have not seen that, that epidemiology. Um, but yeah, so, so the way I could get myself to believe that that's true is just the, you know, the very, very, you know, materially different um, uh, compositions of our diets, right? Where um, in the United States and, and also, you know, a lot of the world, not just the United States, um, you know, it's like hyper processed foods. That's like a category now where it's not just processed food. It's like super duper processed foods, um, you know, devoid of things like fiber, you know, if, if you're drinking a lot of juice, um, you know, soda, et cetera. Right. Just like these this selected and in, enriched specific molecules that taste really, really, really good, devoid of all of the sort of vegetal context in which it's it's delivered right so you're not getting that healthy fiber you're not getting those other vitamins and, and nutrients and so on um and then also we are fortunate to live in a very hygienic situation right where everybody is pretty clean particularly these days constantly washing their hands um and that's not necessarily a, a luxury that's available to everybody in the world and so as a result their immune systems may be just sort of like more regularly exposed to a wider variety of pathogens um and which is just that's good for the immune system but 
I, I think that the, my first reaction is what I am going to go with that. Um, it's just more like, you know, for like, for example, you know, um, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, you know, to suggest that, that it's like not an issue in developing nations, it's sort of missing the point, right? It's that, you know, th this is an age associated condition and we're fortunate to live pretty long time, um, you know, relative to other parts of the world. Although this, I'm, I'm working on this project, it has nothing to do with this, but there's a, there's a, um, a 13 mile area in New Jersey, right? One town called Princeton, where the university is, and another town called uh, Trenton, which is the capital of the state. Those 13, and, and there's different zip codes, right, obviously. And so depending upon which zip code in which you live 13 miles away, there is a over 14 year difference in life expectancy. So you can predict that somebody is going to die 14 years earlier on average if they live this on this side of 13 miles or on that side of 13 miles. It's kind of bananas, a lot of uh, uh, inequities when it comes to health. Um, but anyway, so uh, yeah, let's go to the this other one. So this is kind of a fun one. Um, and I have a fun video for it. The dog. So dogs do that with their ears. Isn't that lovely? I love it when dogs do that. And so there, this is another thing that, that humans have that are essentially pointless. Um, and there are these tiny little muscles that enable our ears to wiggle, right? Our, auricular muscles is, is how they're, what they're called, this category. It's a couple, it's a collection of muscles. Um, and I remember when Wait. I was a kid trying to figure, go ahead. Yeah, Tr you're trying to figure it out. Can all people wiggle their ears if they like train themselves enough? Because I can't do it. Yeah. All people have the musculature to do it. So it's not like, you know, the, the palmaris longus where some people just don't even have the muscle at all. Everybody has those muscles. Um, but yeah, it's just a matter of like, you know, because we just don't use them. <laughs> um, it's just a matter of, you know, having to train yourself. I remember sitting and like trying to figure it out because I think my dad could do it. And it was like very obvious that like he could do it really intensely. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And I ultimately did figure it out. And, and it's kind of crazy when you think about it, right? We can sort of make our entire scalp move. It's kind of bananas, right? And so, um, so yeah, these are our auricular muscles and in animals who have more sort of prodigious ear situations, being able to move your ears this way or that can help to capture sound more effectively, right? Like satellite dishes, you know, puppies do that, dogs do that. Some bloodhounds, I, I've read um, speculation that they also actually use their big old ears to help um, direct more olfactory muscle or olfactory muscles, olfactory molecules to their like magnificent noses, right? Just sort of like, like satellite dish again, right? Uh, I'm not sure how widely accept accepted that explanation is, but in humans, we can barely move our ears as it is. Our ears aren't really all that big relative to like a dog, right? Um, and so, you know, once again, I could imagine that, uh, you know, the ability to move our ears or these muscles are not entirely vestigial, uh, where, you know, there's, it's as an emotion chauvinist in neuroscience, I think emotion is more important than most people um, uh intuitively think, but um, I, I could make the whole argument that like, since our ears tend to wiggle in specific emotional states, right? Like if we're fearful, if we're surprised, um, then, you know, the, the whole argument that like, it's kind of a subtle broadcast to individuals around us that we're having a significant emotional moment, right? Um, which is just one of those things that, that might've been a helpful venue for communication, subtle communication among our ancestors before language or more elaborate mechanism of communication were developed. We're hypersensitive to the, you know, um, facial expressions and changes in facial expressions and particularly eyes. And so theoretically, I could imagine that seeing somebody's ears and scalp move back is sort of like part of a, <laughs> oh, well, this person's scared, right? So I should probably yeah. be scared too, right? I see. But Wait, in Ian, my I, have heart. Two, I have two burning questions. I have to interrupt you. Okay. One, were you ever successful in getting your ears to move? And two, yeah. tell us more what you mean by, an, oh, you were? Can you do it for us? Mm -hmm. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but here, wait. Now I'm all on, on the spot here. <laughs> Can you, see, uh, you probably can't see it. The camera, I don't think I that. Can't the, see it. It's too, it's too yeah. slight. Okay, so definitely not useful anymore. Second question. <laughs> Tell us, tell us more what you mean by you're an emotional chauvinist and can we explore it? Yeah. More of that idea of like our emotions, like vestigial or not. I feel like you're just like glossing yeah. over this cause you're very familiar with it, but. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, um, yeah, so, so, you know, I, as I said, right, I, I studied a, a evolutionarily very, very conserved, very ancient um, circuit in the brain that is sort of like a junction of all of the signaling um, in the frontal regions of our brain, uh, very, very important in the human brain, 
a junction of signaling of all of that, uh, all of those brain regions that then converge on this specific circuit. And then that circuit then um, uh, distributes a bunch of signals throughout the rest of the brain, right? So it's sort of like, um, and, uh, and all, among the various parts of our consciousness that this circuit um, regulates is emotion. Um, and so I say I'm an emotional chauvinist because I think most people, um, when they think of the human brain and human consciousness, they tend to focus on our cognition, right? Um, our executive function, the things that, that are quintessentially human, that are uniquely human uh, for a good reason, right? That, that is the coolest thing about the human brain, but for sure. But um, in doing so, I think people develop a misconception that the relationship between higher order brain function executive function. When I'm saying executive function and, and higher order cognition, I mean, it's like, like it can come down to as be, being as simple as like doing the hard thing, the harder thing, because you know, it'll pay off more in the long run, right? So delaying gratification, uh, making sort of complicated decisions, right? Um, and and I think that people make the the mistake of assuming that, um, you know, that, that if we could only diminish the role and, well and i should also note that part of that executive function part of that higher order cognition from the frontal lobes is literally to inhibit the limbic system the limbic system is the network of brain regions that essentially is the the substrate for emotion in the human brain well in everybody's brain um, Wait, and one of the big you, sorry can you repeat that real quick what's what the purpose of what is to inhibit the limbic system so the prefrontal cortex is is a large region of the frontal lobe it's like right in the middle pretty much um, and like one of its main functions, I mean, quite literally, one of its main functions is to send off signals to parts of the brain that are associated with emotion, right? To inhibit those emotions. Like, okay, yes, so I know saying, this ice cream. You're saying this is where like our, like the concept of like logic or reason versus emotion comes from is, or this, this is part of it. It's like literally like different areas in the brain. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't think that people develop that, that, because they intuitive knew understanding. That, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. But what I, I am, you know, I'm sort of steel manning that, that argument that like, yes, you know, that is a very important role for, for the frontal lobes. However, um, you know, when the, I like to think about, um, you know, rather than being something like competing systems, right, and our emotional systems and mm -hmm. our, you know, let's say higher order cognition, I think of the more as synergistic systems, right? And so these are systems that influence each other and we sort of depend on both both of them in different situations or in different moments. And so, for example, without a limbic system, right, I suspect it would be pretty difficult for a lot of humans to make the thoroughly irrational decision to reproduce, right, without having that primitive, deep-rooted love for another human and that eventual crazy attachment, right, and, and, and unique experience of love when the baby comes around, right, I think it would be hard to make the case that getting essentially zero sleep and having essentially zero spare time and your diet turning into garbage uh, is a particularly good bargain for years, for years, right? It's totally ridiculous. And so that's just one example, right? That, you yeah. know, our emotional systems are crucial to some of the most, you know, important central behaviors that humans ex uh, exhibit when it comes to evolution, right? And so th there's this one last quote that, that, I'll, um, uh, that I'll close on, you know, as an emotional chauvinist, I know I'm going on, but um, so, so there's a geneticist named uh, J.B.S. Halving, right? And so he has a quote, um, quote, I will gladly sacrifice my life for two brothers or eight cousins. Okay. So what does that mean? So he, he was, he was sort of just trying to demonstrate the math here of, of evolution, human evolution. And so when it comes to evolution, the fundamental goal, right? The premise is that, you know, is to pass genetic material onto the future. Right. And so, you know, the, and so the, this quote, uh, I'll sacrifice my life for two brothers or eight cousins. If you save the life of two siblings, you're, and this is totally oversimplified, but you're, you're essentially, if you save the lives of, of two siblings, you know, who share approximately half of your genetic information, then you will have theoretically preserved the equivalent of your whole genome with the two siblings saved. Uh, and then similar concept to the eight cousins, right? Each of has about 12 and a half percent of your genetic, shares your genetic material. And so saving eight of them would be equivalent to a whole you. And so, you know, to be clear, he was just making, doing this math to, yeah. to simplify the point of genetic inheritance. It's not, that's not actually how it works, but it is true that primates will pretty much follow that trend, right? They will, when it comes to aggressors and, you know, other troops, other, you know, um, whatever troops of baboons, let's say, if, you know, there's a threatening baboon, generally speaking, they will first defend their, their direct relatives, their siblings, uh, and their children, obviously, and that, that kind of stuff. And then once they're safe, they will then next 
defend the baboons to whom they are most closely related, you know, after their siblings. And so why do we react that way? It's not like anybody, any organism on earth is actively thinking like, the only reason that I would give my life to save my daughter is so that my genetic material is preserved going forward. Nobody thinks that way. It's purely emotional, right? It's purely the, the, the magnitude of that emotional experience that I have and the attachment that I have to her is so significant that nothing else is going to prevent me from behaving in this way. And we see that same kind of thing demonstrated throughout the animal kingdom. And so it, it, it is that way, right? Because it is a, it is a strategy to preserve genetic material moving forward, right? And so without the emotional system, it would be completely irrational for any organism to sacrifice their own life, right? Uh, because, okay, game over, right? You're done. <laughs> um, and so without the emotional system, that behavior, that that very conserved behavior wouldn't exist. All right. Plus yeah, emotions, so life would suck without emotions. <laughs> yeah, you're, well, and, and you're saying emotions are useful. This, exactly. And like this for what Ian is, uh, to summarize what Ian is describing a little bit, like this is what's known as kin selection, basically. Like yes. from an evolutionary standpoint, evolution is just about successfully passing on your genes. From an evolutionary standpoint, um, having like two kids can be the same as like having multiple cousins. It's just like, are you passing on like a proportionally high amount of your genes? And this is why in some animals, like certain species of birds, for example, um, there's strategies where the siblings, like some, some animal, some animals don't have, um, babies and instead they just help take care of their siblings or future generations of their siblings. And that's because having six from a genetic standpoint, having si siblings that successfully grow up and go on to reproduce is, can be just as good as you having your own kids. And this has been proposed also for as an explanation for why um, homosexuality persists in some animals. And it, it's people have explored this idea and, and in people, it, it doesn't explain homosexuality, but like in some other animals, it, it does basically where it's like, oh, it's kind of a good thing for everyone. If like not everyone is necessarily like having kids and stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. I mean, th and th there's some amazing like, you know, again, nobody's actively think. well, nobody, I mean, I think about it, obviously, because I'm a weirdo, right? And I'm a scientist, right? And so, yeah, I do think about it in, in genetic terms, but um, but nobody does, right? You're, you're responding to emotional reactions. But what's interesting is that if you look at, at like, like, let's say, okay, let's take a troop of baboons, right? Baboons are very aggressive uh, primates, mm -hmm. um, and but they're also very smart, uh, you know, they're, they're baboons, they're big primates. <laughs> but anyways, um, they, they sort of, they, Let's say that there, there's a baboon that's threatening another baboon. Let's talk about male baboons, right? Um, it doesn't have to be male. Um, and the one of the baboons knows that he or she is much weaker, right? And there's no way that this this more you know uh, this stronger, bigger, probably older baboon you know is just going to destroy them. And so what they will do is they will go and find the the offspring that that is most closely related to the aggressor, the bigger aggressor, and essentially hold it up like physically they will do this like hold up the baboon in front of the baby in front of them basically saying like you got to go through your little bit your little cousin or your little uh, nephew or whatever your little niece if you're going to get to me right and it, it's not like they they know they, they, of course they don't think in terms of like this is my great uncle you know but they intuitively know right and it, it's through this whole sort of uh constellation or, or conspiracy of you know, that, that vulnerable nasal organ, right? Where they can smell familiarity. You can smell, you know, you can detect uh, uh, relations there. Uh, sensory systems, obviously. Uh, but then also just this emotional attachment that people, that that they form with other members of their troop, but then also that they know that other members of the troop form, right? And so all of that, or not all of it, but a large percentage of that behavior is driven by emotion. Um, yeah. All right. Well, like, I, will, I realize uh, we're getting we're getting pretty deep into like emotion, <laughs> like our just our the question of our emotions <laughs> evolutionarily beneficial. But I mean, this whole thing also reminds me of how, um, like, often you hear that intuition is some combination of the facts or your like logical side of your brain and like your feelings, and um, intuition has been shown to be like a really good predictor of some things. So for example, um, there have been studies that looked at whether uh, looked at like men who abused women, 
And they basically found that like, if you like collect all the data you can on this, this guy in this relationship, um, nothing is a better predictor of whether he, he will become abusive towards a woman than the woman's intuition, basically. And so like, that's, that's supposedly incorporating like, you know, like all like the data, all the hard facts we can collect on this person. And also just like the, the feelings that they evoke in their partner. Um, even at this stage, like before he's actually become abusive, like this, these kind of like negative feelings in conjunction with like observations of the fact give some intuition of like, oh, I think this person is like dangerous or going to be dangerous and like something just doesn't feel safe. And so that's possibly another good example of um, of like the benefit of of all of these different ways in which our brain is like taking in information and, and trying to convey it back to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, the, the classic example of like, you know, when I was when I was a teenager, uh, I hated that we were emotional, that I had emotions. I wish I could just jettison that garbage part of my consciousness because it's just irritating at that age. Right. And it, everything is just so big deal. Right. Everything's so dramatic and in adolescence. It's torturous. Um, but um, but but, you know, and sort of the classic example is Spock, right? Or the, let's say Vulcans, I guess Spock isn't necessarily 100 percent Vulcan. I don't know, whatever. But, you know, the, the sort of their classic feature is that they don't have emotions. They, you know, they're purely rational. Um, and, I, you know, I think that they were being a little generous regarding what a, a, a race of anthropoids, right, would would look like uh, devoid of any emotion. Because if you think about how how would our morality change? Right. Um, you know, the, maybe the closest analog that we have to what a human would be like without any emotional life would be a soci sociopathy or a psychopathy, right? Where, you know, decisions that are made are made uh, absent any consideration for the ramifications of others. And how do we, how do we detect those ramifications emotionally, right? It, it makes us sad. It would make us grieve. We know it would make other people sad and grieve. Um, that's why it's bad, right? Uh, you know, even if it would be objectively beneficial to you to take somebody out, you know. Um, and so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that, uh, uh, as always, science fiction is the best uh, venue for, for extrapolating uh, what, you know, any given civilization would be like. But, um, but yeah, I, I think that, that it is fortuitous that this is the mechanism that evolved on Earth as the, or the behavioral rudder. It's not perfect, but essentially nothing in evolution ever is. Uh, and I, I think it's pretty good. I'm, I'm glad that I'm capable of feeling the emotions that I can feel when, you know, my daughter uh, learns a new word or we had a, like a straight up conversation the other day while she was falling asleep, which is super strange to talk to, a, to an infant where it's more it's more than just like a she says something, I say something. It's like a she, she says something, I say something, you know, it's back and forth. And it's sort of like mm -hmm. weird, you know, but it's like this deep experience. Uh, and who would, you know, that. The only reason I care about that is the emotional experience that I have. All right, I will, uh, I will uh, save you all yeah. from hearing more about um, emotion. <laughs> well, Ian, we definitely need so, to I mean, have some more, yeah, some more like sci, like sci-fi follow-up episodes because I always want to like go and veer off and geek out on like sci-fi stuff with you. Um, I'm super well, down. Yeah, let's. I'm gonna let's throw. Out, I'm gonna throw out one more, just quick example, wildlife vestigial trait thing, and I think it's an example of how um, I am one of those people that I'm always thinking of like the counter argument, even if I don't necessarily agree with it. And so this is just like another example of of that, I guess, is like wings on flightless birds is another example that's like classic example of vestigial traits, but you know, just the idea is like, oh, they can't fly, but they still have wings. Why would they need wings? But here's a picture of an ostrich, a flightless bird, spreading out its wings to make itself look big and defend its um, nest, actually, in this picture is what it's doing. So this is like our, our goosebumps example with the humans, like birds and many animals have a good reason to want to try to look big. So its wings are still doing something. Its wings are helping it make look, uh, helping it look big. And also its wings can be used to, um, to if they, they can spread them out to help them cool off in the summer, right? So instead of just mm. being this ball that's like conserving heat, they can just hold their wings out. Um, and that helps like with like airflow over their body as long as the air is cooler than their internal temperature. So it can be helpful with that too. So just like a kind of, for our closing remarks, just a quick example of vestigial trait 
or not vestigial trait. So many different directions you can explore with this. Um, and um, I'm getting distracted because Scott is talking more about sci-fi in the comments and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restrain myself. <laughs> no more sci-fi. We've covered a uh, lot just, of cool George, vestigial examples in this. Yeah, go ahead. Jo Georgia, I, I, if I recall correctly, uh, that's mm -hmm. interesting. I'd never heard about that, that basically being a heat sink for uh for ostriches that's that's interesting i i, I believe i recall that clear, like, i just i just made it up i mean i didn't make it up i was just like when i was looking at these examples i was like this doesn't seem right and and that's where that came from but it makes sense right gotcha yeah 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 don't, don't, absolutely um and uh I, I i recall you know there there were all those dinosaurs that have that very large sort of dorsal fin essentially uh, but they're not aquatic right and one of right, the explanations yeah. that I recall, the Spinosaurus, I think is the one that I remember because mm -hmm. spine, obviously. Um, and I, I believe that the explanation was that it could function, since they were cold blooded, it could function as you know a way for them to radiate heat if they needed to, uh, or catch heat if they needed to. It's kind of interesting. Um, okay, I, I have one other sh super short example, mm -hmm. and then another topic that we you know don't necessarily have to get into because it's it's a little bit kind of just just for fun. But uh, you know, a classic example of of a vestigial, well, a part of the body that again is an example of like the line being blurred. It's not like you're either vestigial or you're totally not, right? You're totally useful. That's a um, really good yeah, point. A yeah, example. we were like, here's these different options, but it's not, it's also a continuous mm -hmm. sort of between them. Yeah. What? Right. Team. And so, so yeah, the, the, another classic one that, that is discussed is the coccyx, right? Or the tailbone. And so it's that irritating little protrusion right above the butt, right? And uh, we call it a tailbone for a good reason. It pretty much is the stub of what used to be a tail in our primate ancestors. And, you know, obviously some primates still rely very heavily on their tails to navigate and climb and grasp and stuff. Not so much us, right? Um, but, you know, because we all evolved from a shared primate ancestor that definitely had a very useful tail, a whole network of muscles are sort of anchored to the coccyx. Right. So it's not necessarily entirely vestigial, but but beyond basically being sort of like a boat cleat, right, where you're like sort of tying around all those muscles, um, you know, it, on a dock. I've right? never That's heard that, that metaphor and I love it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, beyond, but beyond functioning like that, it certainly isn't nearly as functionally important as it used to be. Right. And it can sort of be a liability, actually, you know, when people fall on their butts and, you know, fracturing that thing is profoundly painful and and basically debilitating right and it's it takes a long time to heal you know so like having it is not necessarily super great uh but it's also not entirely vestigial so the coccyx that that'll be my closing one i the, the last yeah. topic i was going to go into is spandrels but the reality right. is it's not really directly related um and it's more just sort of like a fun thing to look into so i would suggest anybody that's interested in the relationship between architecture and human evolution uh, look into the word spandrel. Here, I'll take no, I love it. We should um, close with that because this is, we're talking about this in like a biology evolutionary context, but the truth is that things being left over or repurposed in weird ways is not something that's limited to biology and evolution. So um, like in, well, yeah, yes. What you, tell us about spandrels, Ian. Okay. Speaking so here we go. So um, spandrels, um, the, the, the concept it is an architectural term. So, you know, while I think a lot of people are are familiar with the concept of a vestigial organ, I don't think as many are familiar with the concept of a spandrel in evolution. And so a spandrel is a beautiful term, in my opinion, that um, and concept that Steve A. Gould and uh, Richard Lewontin devised to, to sort of describe traits that are basically incidental, right? They have no actual functional benefit. They're just byproducts of another trait, right? So, for example, you know, human blood is red. Right, and it's red because of the specific molecules that compose our blood. Um, it's not red because it's like super helpful to have red blood, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the term spandrel is derived from architecture, as I was saying, and um, it's just sort of like a triangular gap in the corners of arches that are there just because arches are being used, right? You, you cannot have a structure built the way that these structures are built with arches without that little triangular corner, the spandrel. And they're often very ornate, like this beautiful one from uh, the Basilica di San Marco in Venice. Um, but you know, as Gould and Lewontin would describe, they're not really important structures, right? They're only there because arches are On their are own, they're used. not like super functional. Yeah, it's not like this yeah, little triangle is here for this reason. It's, it's incidental to having mm -hmm. a circular and, arch, like you said, in like a square structure, yeah. 
Yeah, and so 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 an, an example of um, that that's generally brought up in discussion of span human spandrels is the human chin, and so humans are the only primates with chins. Uh, well, chins designed the way that they are, right? Uh, which is kind of strange, right? When you think about it, you know. I, and so as our face was shortening, our head was shortening, and our posture straightened, you know, to be more bipedal and, and make all this room for our big old fancy brains up here, um, our mouths started to diminish in size. Right. And so the, the, the lower jaw then began protruding out a bit just purely because of geometry. Right. Making more space for our airways, uh, which were becoming more and more important for communication, obviously. Um, and so, you know, it's not like it's super useful to have a chin. It's there because of the evolution of other traits. That's the argument that a spandrel advocate would make. But the whole concept of spandrels is actually somewhat contentious. Um, some scientists argue that, you know, these various traits actually do have biological functionality, but it's just not exactly obvious what those purposes are. And so Daniel Dennett is a neurophilosopher. He's probably the most prominent crit uh, uh, critic of spandrels. Um, you know, so, so Dennett argues that, you know, the, he's, he, he's a, you might even recognize him if you saw him, if you like ever, I don't know, look at <laughs> neuroscience uh, talks, he looks kind of like Darwin himself, but um, he argues that, you know, just because a trait has a very subtle function, uh, you know, as subtle as just being purely sexually attractive, right, then that's its function. And so to suggest that it's completely incidental, has no point of being there, to argue that that's the case is sort of missing on some very subtle aspects of evolution. I don't really know where I stand on that. Um, I don't really stand in either camp. Um, I, I just love the concept. I think it's beautiful. Um, but and I think you could make the same argument with this wonderful spandrel that we're looking at here, right? You could accomplish the, the, the goal of what a spandrel is doing with other structural features, right? I, I can't remember what they're called, but they're, you know, just basically other ways to reinforce up. Um, and it, it, but they have this, this, uh, this spandrel, they have this venue um, for beautiful art. And of course, you know, part of all these, you know, cathedrals and stuff was they were worship, you know, they, they were structures of worship. And part of that worship was demonstrating all this beauty um, you know, th through the, all this, you know, sculpture and art and stuff like that. And so inevitably that surface is going to be covered with beautiful art. Um, and what's its purpose? Its purpose is to be beautiful. Um, and so that, that would be the counter argument to the spandrel argument. Um, but anyway, this is one of my favorites. Yeah, it's still contributing something because now it's like this right. extra surface that can be decorated in something. And so exactly. it, yeah, it's not completely neutral after all. Um, yeah, yeah so I think like this is the really, line blurs. yeah. Well, and this is really interesting because we've gotten into why it's so hard to say whether some whether or not something is vestigial, um, because like a lot of a lot of things in evolution aren't necessarily like useful, even if they never had a a, a, a purpose. Like in the in the example of vestigial traits, we're talking about things usually that were definitely useful and now are not useful. Yes. We think, but there are all kinds of things in evolution that are maybe not useful and also maybe never really had a strong purpose either a strong adaptive mm -hmm. purpose so this is this we're kind of like in some weird venn diagram now where we're touching on like lots of different uh, <laughs> things in evolution not just not just vestigial traits but i think it's a great place i think it's a great place to to close off and um thank you to everybody for showing up in the comments, everyone in the comments is talking about uh, Foundation and Dune sci-fi adaptations now. Super psyched, so, super psyched. Yeah, they both look awesome. And I, I, I just wanted, so so in case anybody is unfamiliar, I'm sure everybody here is familiar, but there are two other scientists, um, or at least ha have been uh, with us. So there's Deanna C. Hooper. She's a cosmologist, um, studies dark matter uh, in, uh, I don't know if she's moved yet. Um, she has, but, uh, so, I know this from reading yeah. the comments earlier. Oh, awesome. Okay. Well, congratulations, Sienna. Um, so yeah, you should check, check out um, her stuff. She's, she's pretty um, active on HAPS on, on the platform. And then um, Christian Zasa um, is, is here too. He's probably the, the most uh, um, accomplished or, or talented photographer, national photographer I've ever met. Um, and he just has some really beautiful, um, uh, you know, content, right? Uh, for, you know, a feast for the eyes. So check out Christian Zasa. DNC Hooper. And uh, I just wanted to thank you, Georgia, for, for allowing me to join you and talk about some of these quirky little parts of uh, human evolution. I appreciate it. Oh, of course. And, you know, I, I'm thinking now, like Christian and I do a show like every Wednesday at like one Pacific time 
uh, for uh, East Coast time, but it's on humans and wildlife. And this episode actually ended up like integrating like humans and wildlife and what like animals can teach us about ourselves more. So I'm kind of regretting that like we didn't have you as a guest on on that show, but it's fun to talk to you one on one as well. Um, but yeah, definitely check out Deanna and Christian. Um, and thank you everyone in the comments for, for showing up and taking part in the discussion. It was really great to hear all of your input and everything. And yeah, thank you, Ian, for coming on the show. I learned a lot. I always learn a lot from, from listening to you and I always appreciate how deep into, into detail you go. Um, on oh, it's my pleasure. Have. And likewise, yeah. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you everybody. Thank